The concept of an office is strange. If you think about it, it's a weird idea to have everyone commute to one specific place just to work together. So that got me thinking, where did offices even come from? So the idea of everyone assembling at a physical space to work together is a strange concept. I mean, unless you're a doctor or a factory worker or a plumber, you don't need to physically be present to do the work. And so it's a bit of a weird idea. But everyone seems to just accept that that's how things are. Offices are a thing. And then the pandemic hit. Working from home was an alien concept before 2020. People would scoff at the idea. But then COVID changed this perspective overnight. But then fast forward to today in 2023, and most companies seem to be going back to this office concept. I mean, we're seeing massive efforts from companies begging their employees to come back to work. There are incentives, pizza parties, and various other perks being thrown at employees trying to get them back to work. As a society, we just can't seem to come to an agreement on why this strange concept of an office even exists. That's why we need to start at the beginning. When did this idea of an office even start? The word office originally referred to an administrative staff rather than a designated workplace. The closest reference for an office would be something like a records room in vast palaces or royal households. But then again, the workers who would work in these records room actually lived in the palace headquarters themselves because they were part of the royal household. So not exactly how modern offices work, but you can start to see the beginnings of this concept. The first true story step in the development of purpose-built offices actually took place in the 13th century England. This was when the office of Chancery was separated from the royal household and moved over to Westminster Hall. The office of Chancery was tasked with producing official documents and legal letters, and the fact that they were separated to create a separation from the royal household, well, that was a new concept. Work and the royal home were being separated. And this ended up setting a trend for the creation of separate government offices to help streamline work and improve local administration. More and more government offices started to follow suit, and so this movement started to gain momentum. However, private offices were still non-existent. That is until the advent of colonialism. You see, the taking of foreign lands takes a lot of coordination and paperwork. This was largely done by private trading companies. So these private trading companies started building their own administrative offices so that they could effectively govern their new territories. And by effectively govern, we mean effectively squeezing out as much money as possible from these territories. That's why we see that the first purpose-built private offices were done by the British East India Company. This was around 1729 on Leiden Hall Street. Thousands of educated workers would arrive at the building every single day. They'd work long hours trying to find ways on how to effectively tax these occupied lands, trying to find ways to keep the company's shareholders pleased. And then came the Industrial Revolution. And then we start to see more productivity. We start to see more streamlined work and a need for a place where people can come together to coordinate and collaborate. That's when this work model that was set up by the East India Company would start to be emulated by other industries such as banking, railway, petroleum, and telegraphy. Businesses in these sectors were often operated over large territories and they required a large number of clerks to handle the day-to-day -day functions. So you can see the need for an office where people could come together to govern these complex tasks. This kind of gives you an insight into how offices started to take off during that time. So then let's fast forward a few hundred years to the modern offices. You see, the shift to modern offices that resemble Victorian workhouses, that's thanks to the rise of the world's first management consultants. The lessons that they learned from improving efficiencies in factories, well, they brought those into modern office concepts. So you went from this to this. As you can see, these are quite cramped. There's no room for privacy. It wasn't great. And then in the 1960s, we start to see some pushback when it comes to respecting a worker's privacy. The American furniture manufacturer, Herman Miller, started designing a system of office furniture that ended up influencing the blueprint for the modern cubicle. And the blueprint, well, it wasn't very thoughtful. They basically designed a system that made it possible to cram a lot of employees into a relatively small footprint. 
but having the privacy that they needed. So yeah, people weren't too fond of this system either. So this eventually gave rise to the cubicle office system that was quite trendy for a while. So the cubicle system is quite synonymous with modern offices, but this trend was quite short lived. On the other side of the world, Japan was a rising economic power, and they never adopted this cubicle system. Instead, they further expanded on the open office concept. Impressed by this country's rising prosperity, other companies tried to emulate this office strategy, and they ditched the cubicle idea as a result. Today, the Japanese style of open office concepts dominates most office spaces and cubicles are considered old-fashioned. Proponents of the design help say that it promotes creativity, teamwork, and harmony in the office. However, according to this research study, they found that the effectiveness of open offices were quite poor. Majority of the people in that study found open office plans causing high levels of stress, conflict, high blood pressure, and even high staff turnover. Yikes! So with offices being so unwelcoming, you can understand the overwhelming majority of employees today who want to work from home. The pandemic ended up being a great case study that showed that working from home was a very real option for most people. But the question is, does it really work? You see, it's not just about an employee's preference about working from home. The concept certainly has its benefits, which is why so many companies switch to either being hybrid or fully remote for most employees. There's a bunch of research that found that remote work helps with employee retention, it has a positive boost on employees' mental health, and it actually ends up improving productivity because not a lot of time is wasted in commuting and getting ready for work. However, we would be biased if we just highlight the benefits of working from home. Amongst the key drawbacks of the work from home idea include cybersecurity concerns, difficulty with communications, especially with younger employees and remote workers feeling a general disconnect with the company's culture and values. So yeah, working from home, working from the office, these are all relatively interesting concepts and they have their merits, their pros and their cons. But taking a step back and trying to understand the concept of offices and why they even exist in the first place can give us a pretty interesting perspective. A peek into how they influenced our minds and culture over the years is actually very helpful. Understanding the history helps us understand how work was influenced by centuries of debate around this fickle concept of an office. Now, after all this talk about working from home, if you feel inclined to just quit your job and start your own business, I quit. What? Well, stop. There's one critical step that most people miss when they go down the entrepreneurship route. I made a video about that right here. So check it out, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you on the next one.